Hey everybody and welcome back to the second part of our comprehensive setup guide on Assetto Corsa Competizione. In this video we'll be taking a look at every single setup option available in the fuel and strategy and mechanical grip tabs. If you want to learn about tyres and electronics make sure you go and check out part 1, whilst if you want to learn about dampers and aero settings keep an eye out for part 3 of this mini-series. Right, on with the video. Fuel and strategy are fairly straightforward relative to the others but I'm going to make sure no stones are left unturned. Your fuel setting determines how many litres of fuel are in your car when you leave the pits. Having more fuel will make your car heavier and slower, but of course will last longer, whilst having less fuel will make your car quicker and lighter, but you'll have to pit again quite quickly for more fuel. A safe bet would be using around 15 litres for a qualifying session, 60 litres for a half hour race and 120 litres for a one hour race, but of course this can vary a lot depending on fuel consumption and these are pretty safe numbers. Speaking of fuel consumption, the fuel per lap indicator at the bottom of that first box calculates roughly how many litres of fuel you're using per lap. This is a computer generated estimate so feel free to use it as a guide but make sure you always add a little bit more in to be safe. Remaining in that first box we also have the tyres. Now this is simply a choice between a dry compound or a wet compound so use a dry compound of tyre when the track is either dry or damp and use a wet compound of tyre when the track is wet. Tyre set is self explanatory. Each number represents a different set of tyres that can be used. You know you're on a new set of tyres if the wear rates read as 3.00 on each corner but we'll come to that in a moment. The final setting of note in that first box are the front and rear brakes. Changing this number changes the compound of brake pad, which will affect the way in which the car slows down under braking. GT3s have four compounds to choose from. Pad 1 gives you the best braking performance, but will only last you a couple of hours at the most, so I would use these in qualifying and races up to 90 minutes. Pad 2 is an endurance pad, so although these won't give you quite as much braking performance as Pad 1, they generate less friction, so will easily last 12 hours, and it's even possible to make them last 24 hours if you're super careful. Pad 3 is a wet weather pad. You can use it if it's raining to make your braking more consistent and stable, however they don't give you as much stopping power as the first two pads, so only choose these if you know it's going to rain for an entire race and you want to be safe. Pad 4 is pretty much irrelevant when it comes to racing on ACC. They have similar performance to Pad 1 but wear rates are much higher, meaning these will fade and stop working after only a couple of laps. Whilst these are good at demonstrating the technology available in ACC, their usefulness probably stops there, so just stick with Pad 1. I should also point out that GT4s only have two compounds of brake pads. Pad 1 is a qualifying pad, similar to Pad 4 for GT3s, whilst Pad 2 is a race pad. In general, I just stick to Pad 2 for GT4s, unless you're wanting to get the heat in them quickly in a qualifying session. If you do want to keep track of how your brakes and tyres are wearing, you can use the four boxes situated on the left and right of the setup screen, one for each corner of the car. Much like in the main tyre section of the setup menu, wear signifies the amount of tyre wear on the currently selected tyre set, measured in millimetres. The only difference here is that on this page, the depth is shown to an extra decimal place, giving you a more accurate reading. 3.00 means your tyres are brand new, 1.50 means they are ready to go in the bin, and somewhere in the middle is where they begin to lose their performance. Next up, we have our three favourite friends since Snap, Crackle and Pop. It's the iconic trio, Grain, Blister and Flat Spot. Sadly, this type of grain is not quite as enjoyable as Rice Krispies. If, if you've lost me here by the way, just don't worry about it. Let me quickly explain what each of these represent. Graining is when strips of rubber are torn from the tyre during heavy use, but then instantly stuck back onto the surface of the tyres due to the heat, creating an uneven surface. This tends to be caused by scrubbing, which is when your tyres are moving laterally across the surface rather than just rolling forward. In essence, understeer. Blisters are due to the tyres overheating, when chunks of rubber become soft due to this heat and fly off the tyres, this time creating a broken up surface. The key to this is finding out what's making your tyres overheat in the first place and fixing the issue at the source. Flat spots are exactly that, spots on the tyre which are flat. This is usually caused by lockups or general uneven wear, so this can be limited by ABS and other tyre adjustments that I discussed in part 1 of this mini-series. All three of these forms of tyre damage are measured not by numbers, but by descriptions of severity from none to heavy. Finally in those boxes we have pad wear and disc wear, which can allow you to see how each of the different brake pad compounds can affect the wear rates. 29.00mm is an unused pad, whilst 32.00mm is a new brake disc. Don't worry about your discs, but when your pads get to below half of their original depth, so around 14 or 15 millimetres, they're getting close to needing changed. The final box on this page is your pit stop strategy, and this is pretty much self-explanatory. The first line marked pit stop number can be used to set different pit stop presets. So for example, you can make pit stop number 1 a full tank of fuel and a new set of 27 psi dry tyres, whilst you can make pit stop 2 a 20 litre splash of fuel with 28 psi tyres. This allows you to prepare in advance for lots of different scenarios, opening up your options in terms of strategy. All of this can be adjusted on the move in the pit stop hut, but it can be difficult to make massive changes in a short amount of time, especially when you're trying to negotiate the mountain section at Bathurst for example. 
So that's it for the fuel and strategy tab. Now I know most of you will have known most of that stuff already, but I didn't want to leave anything out of this guide. I'm trying to be as comprehensive as possible. Now, time for something that I'm sure far more of you won't understand. Well, not yet anyway. That's probably why you're here. So, let's change that. Mechanical grip. Now there are eight different settings here which you can change, which will all affect the mechanical grip of the car in different ways. Now you know the drill by now, I'm going to be covering each and every one of them. Starting at the front, we have the anti-roll bar. This is a bar connecting the left and right suspension to one another in order to try and limit chassis roll, hence the name. In ACC, clicking to the right means increasing or stiffening the anti-roll bar, whereas clicking to the left is decreasing or softening it. By stiffening the anti-roll bar, you're limiting the amount of chassis roll from side to side, and by softening it, you're allowing your car to lean more. Adjusting the arb will mainly affect understeer and oversteer. There are anti-roll bars on both the front and back of the car. The one on the front will mainly impact how your car behaves going into a corner, whilst the one on the rear will affect how your car behaves on corner exit. A stiffer front anti-roll bar will create more understeer on turning, giving the front tyres less grip, whilst a softer anti-roll bar will give you more front grip, therefore more oversteer. In terms of the rear anti-roll bar, it's pretty much the opposite. Having a stiffer rear anti-roll bar will of course create less grip at the back rather than the front, which means you will suffer from oversteer rather than understeer on the corner exit. Having a softer rear anti-roll bar will give you more grip at the back, leading to more understeer. It all makes sense when you think about it slowly and clearly, so just take a minute to process that information. Brake power is far more straightforward. This just affects how much braking power is applied when you fully press the brake pedal. I'd always recommend leaving this on 100% and letting your ABS and your own braking force take control here. Next up is brake bias, something you will hear mentioned very often in sim racing. This affects how the braking power is distributed from front to rear. The brake bias value is a percentage, and the number represents how much of the braking power is going to the front brakes. So for example, if your brake bias is set to 60%, this means that 60% of the brake balance is going towards the front, whilst 40% is going towards the rear. Clicking to the right on your setup menu increases the bias, moving it further to the front, whilst clicking to the left moves this more to the rear, and is known as decreasing your bias. Increasing your bias will make your braking more stable, but may cause you to understeer on corner entry. Decreasing your bias can make your brakes a little more effective, but less stable, and can cause oversteer when you turn into the corner. As usual, it's a compromise, and many of the top drivers actually change their brake bias between corners to try and change how the car behaves for each individual section of the track. This is why you hear it mentioned so often. It's one of the few tools that drivers have at their disposal whilst driving to be able to influence balance between understeer and oversteer. How exciting! Steer ratio represents the relationship between the steering wheel and the actual wheels in terms of rotation. The value is in degrees, so if your steer ratio is set to 12 for example, this means that for every 12 degrees your steering wheel turns, your front wheels will turn 1 degree. Effectively then, a higher steer ratio means slower steering. I tend to just leave this on the default and use my own rotation settings to try and influence this. Let's jump to the rear now. Now we've already looked at the anti-roll bar, so the only thing that's left is your preload differential, or otherwise known as the diff. Now this is a complex beast, and I don't really have the time to go through every little detail of it in this video. However, in summary, this is a system which allows each individual wheel to rotate at a different speed rather than at the same speed. A closed diff means that torque is distributed more evenly across each tyre, whilst an open diff sends more torque to the tyre with the least resistance, and therefore the least grip. Clicking left decreases the preload which is opening up the diff, whilst clicking right increases the preload which is closing the diff. There are plenty of sources out there if you want to fully understand this in a mechanical sense, but generally a lower preload setting will give you a more agile car when you turn in, and more traction on corner exit, at the expense of some mid-corner understeer. A closed diff or higher preload setting will make your car more stable on turn in, in exchange for instability as you exit the corner, and some mid-corner oversteer. It's all a bit confusing when you know the technicalities of it, but the best thing you can do is try it on both extremes, and see if you can feel the difference, and then of course find a compromise that works for you. Right, on to the final section of part 2, wheel rates and bump stops. These two go hand in hand, so make sure you focus on both of them in tandem. The wheel rate effectively refers to the amount of pressure needed to compress the suspension spring, measured in newton meters. To put it simply, a spring requiring more pressure could also be described as a stiffer spring, so increasing the wheel rate by clicking right makes the spring stiffer, whilst decreasing and clicking left makes the spring softer. Generally speaking, a stiffer front suspension will result in the car being easy to point where you want it and well planted, while softer front suspension will make the car turn or rotate easier. The effects of this are even more evident when you're off throttle, because when you think about it, when you lift off the throttle, the weight of the car transfers towards the front, giving your front tyres more grip. In terms of the rear suspension, you do kind of generally want a stiff setup, but if you begin to feel the back end sliding everywhere, you might have gone too far. You will often get away with stiffer suspension setups on smoother circuits, whilst if the track's very bumpy, you might need to soften it all a little bit. It's also highly dependent on other factors such as ride height, dampers, or aero adjustments, all elements that will be covered in the next video. 
The key is to be patient with your adjustments, and take the time to learn how each element works together in order to affect the car. Literally one click left or right can make all the difference in terms of feel and lap time. The final elements in this video are bump stop settings, and like wheel rates, this affects the stiffness of the suspension. Bump stops are effectively blocks of rubber that sit inside the spring, designed to stop the damper bottoming out. You can visualise these in the setup menu on ACC. The bump stops are the little red block on the diagram, although the size isn't proportionate. Increasing the bump stop rate by clicking to the right increases the firmness of the bump stop, and therefore the stiffness of the compression. Decreasing this by clicking to the left effectively makes the bump stop squidgy for want of a better word, and therefore the compression is softer. The bump stop range affects the thickness or height of the bump stop, which in turn affects the amount of room that the spring has to compress before it hits the bump stop. Think of the space in between as the bump stop range, it could also be described as the suspension window. On the wee diagram in the middle, the yellow line represents the start of the suspension, which is related to the wheel rate, whilst the red line represents the start of the bump stop, which was related to the bump stop range. As you can see, if you increase the bump stop range by clicking right, you increase the gap between these two lines. The smaller the gap between these two lines, the smaller the window is for the spring to compress, and therefore the stiffer the suspension becomes. Generally speaking, GT3 cars like having these two lines close together because it creates a stiff suspension, but if you're trying to rotate the car around a corner and the outside tyre, for example, is being held back by the bump stop if you're hitting it too early, you might need to increase the bump stop range to give yourself a little bit more room, which makes the suspension softer and could give you more grip. It's also worth pointing out that you will generally see a much larger bump stop range on the back than the front because this aids traction out of corners. These wheel rates and bump stops are a lot to take in if it's new to you, and they do kind of go hand in hand, so you will need to take some time to get on top of them. All I can say is use the centre diagram to your advantage to try and learn exactly what's happening on each corner of the car and how that might affect how the car is behaving. You're probably going to need a minute or three to let all that info sink in, but the good thing is that thanks to the wonderful world of YouTube, you can go back and listen to this as many times as you need to. Hopefully this is helping you guys and girls understand a little bit more about car setup on ACC, and if it is, make sure you check out the other parts for the full picture. Oh, and subscribe to the channel whilst you're at it. I'm off for a lie down, so in the meantime, keep it pinned, thanks for watching, and good night.